Their practice participates in what it represents, an art of social warming in an era of global warming. Food ethics and politics are central to their practice. Generating food that brings human and ecological health and global justice is their creative call to arms. They teach foraging and other accountable living skills and are bloggers, writers, poets, artists, video makers who also make music, but mostly they are a family who belong to, as they say on their website, to a bloody great community and therefore are much more than the sum of their parts. Will you please join me in welcoming Patrick. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thanks. I'd just like to begin by acknowledging that I live and labour on Jara people's country, and as far as is known, Jajurong is the first language of this land. I acknowledge the six Jara seasons and pay homage to the regenerative economies upon which their living culture sits, the spirit of which my household draws upon in our everyday living while drawing on our own indigenous peoples through story and the ancestral plants, animals, microbes and mushrooms that have also emplaced on this country. Um, before I start, um, I'd like to, uh, by a show of hands, who has heard of the term permaculture? Um, okay, so pretty much all the room. And uh, also, um, this is, might be a bit trickier, and feel free to give it a bit more thought, but what, if you could just get in your mind a rough answer, what, how much of your economy is um, monetary, so based on money? and maybe how much is made up of our other economies. Um, <clears throat> so, just a quick introduction to my practice. Uh, I uh, left school, um, went off to art school immediately, um, was pretty driven by about halfway through year 11. Um, I had a fantastic art teacher and Lidston, um, and it was very encouraging, and I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to be an artist. Um, I did uh, very badly at school, um, particularly at English, um, but when I got to art school, I started writing poetry um, as an aside or alongside um, my visual arts interests. Poems, um, books, prints and paintings, uh, I guess, were the beginnings of my investigation into the arts. Um, I did a couple of degrees in painting and drawing, uh, and then started to exhibit in Sydney and Canberra and places like that, where I was living, um, and then started asking questions about the art world and what I was doing and what was this art that I was making and what and who uh, inevitably was it who who was it for and it, it led me to a whole lot of political and social and economic questions um, my year was the first year uh, to be slugged with hex in 1989 and as a defiant first year art student I said I will never earn the money <laughs> to the threshold to pay a cent of it back and I'm 48 in a few weeks, and I have kept that pledge to myself. I'm sure there are plenty of people in Australia who would loathe me for that, <laughs> but uh, I'm pretty proud of myself for that. <clears throat> um, so being an artist, coming from a, a home life with my parents being, uh, I guess, their economy was based on making money from jam, turning a hand at a whole lot of things, um, food related, we had a big produce garden at home. Uh, I guess I, I would call that a proto-permaculture garden that I was, um, uh, I grew up in. Uh, it was five acres in country New South Wales. And I got pretty interested in plants from an early age. And my dad taught me how to propagate plants. And in uh, high school, I um, uh, had a wholesale nursery and that was my pocket money. So propagating plants and being close to plants was a big part of my early years and 
running concurrently with this love of plants was punk music and destructive culture and city culture and the uh, interest in the liveliness of uh, a, a punk tear it apart sort of aesthetic and how uh, I managed to bring those two together, um, I guess, is um, for a later part of this talk. But um, so there was a, an agitated, um, unsettled uh, boy who found solace in wild spaces such as creeks and um, overgrown, unkempt um, reserves near where I grew up and, um, and in growing and handling plants. Um, I guess uh, the, the question of, about art kept coming up for me. I uh, exhibited at various commercial galleries. Uh, I started to sell some work and I started to be successful in getting funding um, to do certain projects. But all the time through my 20s and into my early 30s, uh, the art world, in inverted commas, sat really uneasily with me. Um, at the same time, I, I, I found that all the so-called crap jobs I had to do, like waiting and the service industry and uh, digging ditches, uh, building, starting to pick up skills, was actually giving me quite a great handle on how people think, how different people operate, what it means to be uh, uh, treated poorly in a cafe by people. <laughs> I think many, many of us in the room might know that one. Um, yeah, what, what it means to be physically working for your bread and butter and where art fits into all of that. And slowly, bit by bit, um, as I, I don't think um, men really become any good until about their mid-30s. <laughs> well, I certainly didn't. And uh, um, so, but by my mid-30s, I sort of had a bit more of a handle on life. In, <laughs> an impression I have, uh, and having, having been, now, being now a dad to two boys, one who is in his... Uh, teens and one who was uh, just about to turn six. Um, I've been quite fascinated by boy brain development, um, theirs and mine, and the kids in the bush school that I take uh, on Fridays, and and the, the young people in the town that I've coached in soccer or been involved with through um, my son's friends, etc. Um, so. By about uh, yeah, 35, I had a radical change in my life. Um, I started to seriously deconstruct um, the, the idea of art that I had established. Um, and even though the book art that I was making was very much based upon um, getting a uh, getting to more of a de democratic art and making books that were affordable um, rather than, say, single objects that were very much out of the reach of many people. So I guess book art was my sort of move away from creating what I would call elite objects of culture. Um, I might actually show, uh, show you the, the work that I did in that time. Um, short video uh, and then uh, move on to artist as family but um, so from prints, prints and drawing um, always my love of plants um, moving through this period of time but from prints and drawing to um, book arts to then this work this first collaborative work I did with a guy called Jason Workman um, we were called Workman Jones and we were really I guess uh, we called our practice biophysical graffiti or physical graffiti, and we were really trying to decouple ourselves from traditional forms of art practice. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll get that up for you to have a look at, and then we'll get to artist as family. I guess in a way, 
Workman Jones, the three years between 2006 and 2009, um, we're starting to look at much bigger world issues. Um, is a kind of it wasn't it'd be too far to say it was a doomer art practice, but it was certainly an end looking at end time um, ideas, uh, capitalism uh, running its course. What does that mean for our culture? A breakdown of relationships, a constant unsettlement that I certainly felt as an artist in Australia, uh, particularly around issues of the environment and climate um, and greed and uh, consumption. And also beginning to, at that time, I was beginning to think through what how do we how do we arrive uh, in what I call hyper techno civility? How do we how do we become people uh, conditioned to extract and pollute and to leave very little left of the very things that support life um, of the, the biomes that actually make more life possible? Um, so. That was a very urban response. Uh, I've lived, apart from a few years uh, in cities, I've lived the majority of my life in rural, um, quite remote sometimes, or town environments, and always had access to a forest or a grassland that was uh, accessible to, to public. And a lot of my thinking um, has taken place courtesy of that life, um, courtesy of understanding, um, I guess, the dissolution, the dissolution of the ego that um, living in non-anthropocentric centres uh, enables. And so um, the city reflects back to us as hyper-techno civilians that we are the dominant, most important species on Earth. Um, apart from a few pets and pests, um, urban spaces, highly urban spaces, are wholly human-centric. What does that mean in the making and the shaping of our culture? What does it mean as culture makers when our whole big cultural thrust is to be anthropocentric? And yet that story is never talked about. No one ever says, hey, we're anthropocentric, isn't that great? Of course, it's a taboo subject. Um, so I guess Workman Jones was sort of the beginnings of working through the doom uh, scenarios, scenarios um, before getting to artist as family. The other thing, uh, that practice had a, had a real uh, time. Um, three years, uh, it was sort of um, right at the time where I guess live art was uh, becoming uh, popular around the world. We weren't really... Jason and I weren't really art followers. Um, we kind of got caught up in, in the live art branding. Um, we weren't really aware of that term when we were doing what we are doing. I think it was just more cultural inertia that got us to make that practice, just like everywhere around the world um, where that practice started forming. And then museums, it was, an, it was, you know, it was, a, it was a rigorously anti-art uh, practice and yet we started getting invitations uh, from museums to come and do or, or our cultural centers to come and do projects and um, and so from 2006 to 2009 um, my main practice was workman Jones and just holding down a whole bunch of building and hospitality jobs to, to afford to make that work um, and then we were invited to uh, the United States to do a really big show and that's when uh, I said I think this is becoming oxymoronic this practice um, my new partner at the time Meg Ullman and I had just helped our community pedal enough power to watch the film in our town hall called The Age of Stupid and Meg and I both walked out from seeing that film and said we will never fly again we broke that last year <laughs> uh, so, but for several years we didn't fly. We we did. We were invited last year or the year before to by um, an indigenous group up in Cairns to come and uh, talk about fermentation and health. 
and we felt that that was an acceptable uh, project to break, break the no-fly policy. Um, but when I got together with Meg, she also had environmental ideals and dire and doomsday scenarios can only feed the soul so much. Once you're aware of the realities, what do you do? And so Artist's Family was formed by Meg and I getting together and saying, we're parents, we're community participants, yes, we're artists. Um, and while the great uh, amount of information that we were accruing about the state of the world, about ecology, about climate, about social injustices, um, while that's all very depressing, um, uh, you also, there are things to, to be done about it. And so Artist's Family transitioned uh, from a practice, I, su I suppose, of anti-art uh, and representing a kind of urban anti-life aesthetic um, to uh, getting very much involved in permaculture uh, principles and action and applying those principles, the 12 principles that David Holmgren writes about. I'll just mention a couple. Um, uh, produce no waste, bad, uh, value the marginal. Um, but the, I think um, most of you would know that pretty much permaculture is applied ecology, how human beings can apply ecological structures to whatever they're doing. And so um, for, I guess, the last decade, Meg and myself and, and many others have been applying um, the ecological principles of permaculture to our own, not just our own art practice, but our practice of, of life or the way in which we live. Um, so um, a few years ago, we've been asked to do a number of uh, different projects. We're normally sort of sitting on the fringes. Um, there's that principle, value the margins, um, the, the fringes of, of the art world. Um, pro uh, projects like this, Future Lands 2, uh, which happened a few years ago, was a, a sort of mashing of indigenous knowledge holders and elders, climate scientists, economists, artists, writers, um, uh, soil scientists, um, a whole bunch of people coming together uh, in Candos, New South Wales. Uh, this is the, the, uh, the, the newspaper that was printed of all the different projects, all the different people working across fields. Um, uh, I think there's a number of these sorts of projects um, that are getting up and about where, where there is a lot of interdisciplinary, cross-cultural uh, um, exchanging going on at the moment to try to uh, work through some of the arguments and sticking points and try to find some, um, some, some good responses to the predicaments of our time. Uh, this was our contribution. What the hell are you doing, artist's family? Um, I guess, in a way, this was an opportunity um, to describe why we call um, what we're doing an arts practice and not, say, uh, a sustainability practice. But it really, um, uh, language is, I think, um, so reductive uh, or can be so reductive, um, it's, it's a practice of everyday life and it is both creative, um, sometimes poetic, sometimes spiritual, sometimes pragmatic, sometimes economic, uh, and a range of other things. What we've done here is imagined, cr created a kind of um, imaginary um, set of questions, but most of these questions, I think all of these questions have been asked by certain people at, at given at talks or uh, we've been interviewed or um, and so we've just sort of mashed a whole bunch of questions around our practice together into what the hell are you doing? Uh, academic so, uh, asks us, so what exactly is a neo-peasant? So our response is, a neo-peasant is someone who, who's involved in the household and community economies and has a close relationship to their local land, which is reached and understood primarily on foot. We incorporate small-scale agrarian foraging, hunting, preserving, and fermenting knowledges in our day-to-day -day processes. <laughs> 
A neo-peasant requires little money and resists wage slavery, debt, and the heavily militarized global economy. A neo-peasant most likely doesn't shop in supermarkets, own a car, a credit card, or a television, meaning we do not have to go to work or do much money work to pay down debt, and therefore we have time to organize and be accountable for our food and energy resources. A neo-peasant will often come from the middle classes but finds consumerism repulsive. Neo-peasants are pragmatic and are voluntarily reconnecting with their peasant roots before they're forced to simplify under future global economic contractions. In this way, neo-peasants are pioneers in moving backwards. Neo-peasants are economic conservatives who shun radicals like Adam Smith. We are cultural radicals who disregard conversion, religion, Promethean anthropocentrism, and patriarchal polemicists. Our gender compass finds true north in that branch of feminism known as radical homemakers, uh, to which the academic replies, aren't you just middle class people colonizing the discourse by calling yourself neo-peasants? Our, our response is, the vi to that, question that actually took place on social media. Um, the violence of majorities and minorities is indistinguishable other than to identify that one is aggressive and one is retaliatory. We don't believe we're being violent by identifying with those in our cultural past who lived simply and in relationship. We're middle class by a couple of generations and we're turning things around incorporating permaculture principles to transition from a dependency on industrialized economy and resources. We're facing our peasant and indigenous ancestors from Europe, calling out to them, singing the songs of our old people when the world was quiet enough to hear them. We understand we don't have to be Promethean monsters anymore. We don't have to be hyper-techno civilians who have forgotten the faults of Epimetheus. We don't have to participate in permanent war fighting under the banner of Christian capitalism. We have ancestors who knew how to live well in the world, and we're returning home to this wellness on Jajaburong country in respect of our old people and in respect of the old-timer ancestors of the land we now live within, who, who share similar ethics and processes when it comes to making life and making more life possible generation after generation. Artist's family is just one response to the predicament of industrialized arts practice framed by the growth imperatives of money. Money must grow, it must keep writing IOUs, which forms in the arts as innovation anxiety. To stand above, to be more extreme, to, be more no to, to make more noise. Our name takes the solo career sadism out of culture making and gets back in touch with daily fermentation, brewing diverse communities involved in the performances of stalling death momentarily to make beautiful moments of inebriation and poem making. So the, I would, I'd like to leave this um, newspaper here actually for um, use at the school. Um, so you can read the rest of the, uh, of the article. But just to, I guess permaculture has probably been the single um, most influential part of the practice. It particularly looks at um, uh, positive activism in the space of the everyday. Um, when we're uh, participating in uh, projects such as this, um, it's, a ch it's a chance to be a little bit cheeky uh, and uh, a bit provocative, to be a bit rat baggy mentioned um, the influence on the punk generation uh, as a teenager um, and the influence of plants. Um, so there's the coming together of um, the telling different stories, um, particularly around economy, um, getting past the idea of smashing shit up, uh, which is the punk aesthetic, to actually um, building, um, rebuilding ecologies. As a, as a punk aesthetic, I suppose. Um, so that punk becomes regenerative, it, 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 which is, you know, again, going against the dominant forces of extractive culture, of pollution ideology, um, of the dominant forces of, of the dominant culture. Um, so 
uh, our very Artist's Family's very first project um, happened, uh, or the way that Artist's Family formed was back in 2009 as part of This Is Not Art Festival. I was invited to do a, um, a solo residency and I was looking at the idea of solo residencies and solo art practices very critically at that point and I really didn't want to um, go away for three weeks uh, from uh, my family and um, I was also noticing my seven-year-old boy who's now nearly 17 um, that uh, his, the way in which he plays, the way in which he's learning is connected to his play. Um, I really wanted to try and emulate that in my art practice. Like what, what do children have uh, to, uh, to, to, to teach us? Um, I just finished reading Michael Pollan's latest book called How to Change Your Mind which goes into psychedelic <laughs> research over the last uh, 40, 50 years. And what scientists have found is that the psychedelic trip is very much like the child's brain. It is not set um, by a default mode network, which uh, creates, you think of like lovely white powdery snow, um, and you think of children playing along that snow and making their impressions and then another snowfall comes and covers it up. Uh, the, the way in which children live in the minute and dissolve their ego um, is because their default mode network isn't very developed. Um, whereas as we get older, the same tracks go down that snow and compact the snow and we find ourselves making the same um, uh, incursions or, or, or lines and we get uh, embedded in that same uh, story. Um, so yeah, so I guess for Artist's Family, um, the, the, every detail of the day to day from fermenting vegetables to sowing and planting vegetables to community gardening to managing, um, uh, gorilla managing um, public areas of forest uh, really to stop um, fire authorities from going in there and continuing to burn uh, those forests um, every three or four years and, and set those forests back in terms of um, diversity and making them much more fire prone. Um, so doing uh, holistic land management, um, guerrilla land management practices to stop, uh, to, to lower the fuel load while not um, m mitigating, while so advancing, I should say, the ecological values of that forest. So slowly chop and drop permaculture techniques of um, crushing down blackberries rather than disturbing the soil. As soon as you disturb weeds, uh, you get a plethora of weeds return. Um, really seeing that every aspect of our day to day is a performance in the practice of artists as family. Um, that is reading or making up a story at bedtime, that is drawing uh, our own adult designs for permaculture gardens we might be asked to, um, to design, it might be drawing with small kids, it might be making more traditional forms of art like films or poems or um, uh, uh, photographs. Um, to, right through to uh, the growing and fermenting of food as what we see as the, the fundamental creative acts of non-monetary economies. And so non, the non-monetary economies account for over 70% of our economy now. And that's why we have no anxiety around arts funding. <laughs> um, because we can run our practice without it. Um, we uh, we don't, um, well, a, a big part of becoming non-monetary was for both Meg and I to get rid of our cars. Cars are a huge burden um, uh, to one's weekly economy. Of course, rent is too, but if you're renting or you're paying a mortgage, at least you have access to land to grow another type of economy. Uh, the only thing I think cars are really good for is parking them in a sunny spot and uh, raising seeds in them. So they make great sun, sun houses, uh, glass houses. Um, they can 
in that way they can augment another economy. But um, the average Australian uh, car now costs around $15,000 per annum. Um, that's with depreciation, wear and tear, all, all factors, licenses, petrol, maintenance, etc., all factored in. Um, and the average household has over two cars. So the average household in Australia is now finding around over $30,000 a year just, just to have the privilege to use a car. Now, probably most of us have, in this room, being in the arts, have shitty cars. Um, that's a gross generalisation, but um, uh, I hope you don't. I hope you have a great car. Um, but uh, ours certainly were, were pretty crappy, but then again, they still constituted 50% of our required income. So going car-free was all of a sudden 50% of the monetary economy, which is exactly equitable to 50% of the carbon economy, was wiped out by going car-free. Now, that took some planning. It took some behavior change. I think artists, uh, because we're a bit loopy and we're a, a bit on the margins often of, of society, we're doing unusual things, um, we're actually quite good at behaviour change. I think uh, the arts and permaculture is a really great uh, marriage in many respects. And of course, you don't need to call it permaculture, it can be called ecological economy making or um, whatever. It, permaculture is just a sort of buzzword, really. Um, so, yeah, so getting the, f the first car we sold, uh, we, we, we put the second car in the, in, the, in the carport, which is now called the bike port, for a whole year with a logbook next to it, and we tracked, uh, we recorded every time we needed that uh, car, and at, at the end of the year we assessed that we didn't need it. So it took a year uh, of sitting with one ready to go, should there be an emergency. We, we uh, lucky enough to live just a, a, a kilometre to a public uh, bus place, but there are only you know the public buses in Dalesford where we live, um, or public transport is is nominal, um, and we're doing this as a family. Um, so uh, you know it, it does raise a whole lot of challenges, but um, very soon uh, we became the fittest amongst our friends. Uh, we had more time, well, we were walking and bike riding everywhere. Um, we had more time to stay at home uh, and not be out earning income to start growing our food. So we became whoop, equally uh, you know, healthier again in that respect. And so we really started not, we, would, we, we wouldn't call ourselves foodies at all. In fact, the whole um, food capitalism thing is, is really quite repugnant to us. But falling in love with soil that you have nurtured and the food that nurtures you back and then the human manure that you put in the system to go back into a safe biological system to then go back to the soil feels really damn good. And all of our processes are creative acts. All of them come from um, thinking through culture as a creative uh, ferment. Everything is fermentation. Um, so. Uh, I guess our practice is very much based on um, the non-monetary economy, um, really trying to decouple ourselves from those big industrial narratives that keep people, uh, what we see, keep people very locked in to a high consumption, high polluting lifestyle. Um, and. Uh, I guess I guess if there's a, a, a message that artist as family um, that sort of uh, brackets our practice is that we do not have to be victims of the global monetary economy. We do not have to be victims of it and we do not have to, have to be participants of it. And if we are not, we are making different forms of culture. And uh, I guess after... Um, yeah, nearly 50 years, um, that's what I've learned. So that's probably time for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patrick. We've got time just for a couple of questions. So we have any? Yeah, down the back. What's the name of the, um, the principles that you mentioned? Yes.
Um, so there, uh, David Hong. If you just uh, Google permaculture's twelve principles, they are written by David Holmgren, who lives in Hepburn. Um, yeah, so uh, you'll find them, and it's yeah, they're easily um, laid out. They're really fantastic. Yep, yeah. um, first of all, like, that's awesome. Yeah, you can combine the two practices of art um, permaculture to create kind of like a plant-based punk or a photosynthetic punk approach. I like that. Um, what was the book that you referenced? The, um... uh, How to Change Your Mind? Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, um, yeah uh, it's by Michael Pollan, who's written a lot, particularly on food and industrial farming. He wrote The Omnivore's Dilemma. He wrote a book called Cooked, uh, which really went into our uh, uh, looking at the food and what it's doing to people. Um, and uh, he's now written this one on psychedelics. And, and the new, uh, you know, the post-Timothy Leary and the whole counterculture, but actually the work that's been picked up by scientists and, uh, I guess, you know, the, the beautiful edge between materialist, materialist science and shamanism. Um, and that, it's a... That's what makes it such an interesting book because I think what artists' family have recognised is that animist cultures, our ancestral cultures that had spirit in their food and spirit in the land and understood were in relationship with that, um, you know, come from shamanistic cultures. And as we so-called progressed um, into small towns through monotheism, like the initial poem that I had, and then to full-blown materialism, it's just like we're full-blown urbanites basically, and. So in this book, there's this sort of underlying question about, well, uh, if we are just progressive, if we are just progressive in the left con political context, or if we're obsessed with progress in the right-wing sense, it's linear. Whereas ecological culture is cyclical, there has to be returns. We have to be regressive as well as progressive. And so making returns, referring and drawing back to cultures that um, we may not want to take everything on board, but in terms of land spirit and land connectedness and de-anthropocentricism, um, I think there's a lot to learn, um, particularly from our own, uh, the people's countries, uh, countries that we dwell upon here in Australia. We're so close to that, uh, to that culture. Uh, Andrew? Yeah. Um, yeah, I was talked by Matty Clark, who's an indigenous um, theorist, and she said, well, we should just replace the Anthropocene with colonialism. Because really, it's, it's a particular cultural, you know, Western cultural approach to uh, ecology and the world. Um, and I know you've had quite a bit to do with learning from the indigenous cultures in Australia. I wonder if you could just talk about that. Yep, sure. Um, yeah, so uh, a few years ago, we, uh, as a family, got jumped on two bikes. Uh, there were five of us, um, a teenager, or near teenager on the back of my tandem, or our tandem, and our little dog, Zero. Um, and then our, our baby, who was 14 months old, and Meg uh, on another bike, and we, over 400 days, slowly made our way up the east coast of Australia. This is a, quite a big story. Um, we did write a book about it called The Art of Free Travel. Um, but the, uh, the, the, the context of that was how you know, permaculture travel, like permaculture is based in settlements, but if we want to keep moving around, how do we move around? And this was one response. Uh, we've since done other things um, to look at different forms of permaculture travel, but one of the big parts of that was to um, learn from Aboriginal uh, communities along the way uh, but also, in part, what we understood about our indigenous ferals and weed species that we were, have been incorporating in our diet for, for a number of years now. And so we, uh, there's a number of encounters, usually on a jetty, where the, there's a common activity around food um, pro, uh, procuring. Um, we start talking to a whole bunch of people, indigenous and non-indigenous, uh, but ultimately get an invitation back to someone's place uh, or uh, someone's country, and then we would uh, exchange knowledges around uh, food that uh, was not under lock and key. So we've been fascinated with indigenous economies because the food is 
not under lock and key. It is uh, therefore there isn't that extraction or, or um, capital pressure that's pl placed on the land. It's a subsistence, um, maybe surplus second, but subsistence first. And now that is absolute sort of economic um, uh, sacrilege to talk about subsistence. But I think that if we don't return to uh, the sorts of economies that existed in Australia pre-1788, not in imitating and replicating, but in, in, the, in the idea that they're regenerative, they're democratic, um, and they're land first, people second, or at least land people at the same instance. Um, and thinking several generations ahead. And uh, there is so much to learn from Aboriginal peoples from around the world. But as we're in Australia, um, in terms of economy and economic modelling, we have the best economic models uh, to draw on. And yet we go to Adam Smith. And of course, that's all to do with power and, and greed. It's got nothing to do with the sanctity or care of the land. So I, I think what we've learned from um, Aboriginal peoples uh, around Australia from both reading the history, people like Bruce Pascoe, uh, his, his book Dark Emu is a fantastic place to start um, in terms of looking at agrarian, indigenous in agrarianism pre-1788. Um, but the, the live, uh, uh, I guess in, in many respects, uh, there's a lot of common ground. Um, our, you know, my peasant ancestors several generations ago were dis, uh, dispossessed through the enclosures um, in England, uh, the, the clearances in Scotland, um, and then we became the factory fodder of the industrial, early industrial cities, of which sometimes there wasn't enough work, but also lack of land and lack, lack of land uh, cosmology and story leads us to things like substance abuse. So uh, we become petty criminals. A lot of my ancestors came here as convicts, some as free settlers, and then uh, and then we those people dispossessed Aboriginal people. So the great trauma of that story, of uh, of capitalism, really, um, of of I know, while it was happening in feudal England, the enclosures. Capitalism, the, the early capitalists really took over from the feudal uh, power brokers and ramped up the enclosures, made sure that peasants didn't have access to land. And it's been several years, uh, several generations of great disruption, lots of substance abuse, lots of greedy uh, extraction, not much spiritual connection to country. Um, I think Aboriginal, I, I feel like. There is an enormous amount of historical privilege in this being. Uh, I'm two generations middle class. Um, and, and that is a huge historical difference, historical privilege difference between contemporary Aboriginal people. And I recognize that. But the story is very similar. Um, it's not as grotesque. I, I, I wouldn't say peasants being dispossessed is as grotesque and genocidal as what happened in Australia. Um, but it is still the same story of disruption to a land embeddedness. And we've had the sort of culture of disruption and unsettlement that creates uh, violence and creates tension in the world. Um, so I think Artist's family is very much drawing on uh, indigenous uh, uh, intelligence when it comes to land connectedness to try to re-perform that in our household and community economies. Um. I'm sure we had heaps more questions, but we are out of time. So will you please um, join me in thanking Patrick. Thank you so much. <laughs>